Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this press conference for all of you here in the room and also on the live stream. You're joining the press conference at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum 2016 from Davos. And we have the great pleasure to be uh, joined on the panel here by Dr. Nahavandian, the Chief of Staff of the Presidency of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Thank you for joining us. And also uh, by Dr. Sarif, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And to my immediate left, uh, I'm joined by Miroslav uh, Duzek, who's the head of Middle East and North Africa at the World Economic Forum and also a member of its executive committee. Thank you for joining us all. Um, Mirek, uh, I think everybody in the room knows um, the importance uh, of this presence here, but I would still ask you to give some uh, context from the uh, perspective of the World Economic Forum, please. Thank you, Georg. Uh, so the perspective from the forum, uh, we're very proud to uh, welcome uh, President Rouhani here in 2014 in the, uh, in, the, in the new momentum for Iran and the world. And we've been very supportive to the P5 plus one process um, on behalf of the international community uh, through our impartial, impartial platform in Davos. We were very happy to see that there was a conclusion this past summer. And of course, this is a timely moment right now in Davos, uh, just the days after the uh, implementation day uh, that uh, was the uh, result of the of the Vienna agreement. So this is the context. We are a warm welcome again to Dr. Nahavanj and Dr. Zarif. Uh, uh, the floor is yours for any uh, uh, opening statements you would have. Well, a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I think we have moved from a very difficult period in our uh, history uh, and shown that we can, in fact, make diplomacy work through engagement based on mutual respect uh, and based on attempting to see the interest of everybody and addressing the interests of everybody without necessarily imposing or accepting submission. I think that is an important achievement for diplomacy uh, in the international community, a good lesson to be uh, applied elsewhere, and also an important uh, lesson for our region where conflict and crisis uh, is ravaging uh, throughout the region, uh, particularly caused by uh, extremism and violence and terrorism, which cannot be contained to any part of our region. So I think it is an important moment in the history of our region. Uh, we regret the fact that some in our region continue to see conflict and tension as uh, the possibility for them to engage in policies that have proven counterproductive, in fact destructive, of regional stability and global order. We hope that uh, everybody starts listening to the voice of reason and engage in the common struggle that we all need uh, against the common enemy, uh, which again is the enemy of all of us. Extremism and violence today represented by ISIS and by uh, Nusra Front and by Al-Qaeda uh, are not going to uh, be a menace for a particular country or a particular region. We have seen from Sydney to Ottawa, from Paris to San Bernardino, that the same ideology, the same approach, which has nothing to do with Islam, is ravaging, murdering, massacring, causing bloodshed, and we all need to come together to deal with that. And Iran is ready and we call on all our neighbors to also be ready. I think we showed that Iran is a serious partner in the international community. We resolved a crisis that people thought could not be resolved. Now let's deal with crises that we all believe can be resolved because the enemy is a common enemy and we all have said at least that we oppose that enemy. Thank you, Dr. Salif. Dr. Nahman. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, from economic point of view, uh, welcoming this uh, joint plan of action would be to engage economically. Business can best 
serve peace uh, and cooperation. Uh, so we have to take this opportunity, uh, which was the result of a win-win approach to uh, economic front, um, joint ventures, uh, foreign investment uh, is welcomed in new Iran. There are ample opportunities which can serve uh, uh, job creation, not only inside Iran, but also um, for regional cooperation. Uh, Iran already a strong economy, which has proved its resilience during the, this long years of sanctions um, is ready for uh, any constructive uh, proposal for many projects which has already been prioritized uh, and can serve the benefit of region and global markets, uh, namely global transit corridors which uh, can go through Iran and uh, can be very economical, cost effective for uh, all cargo and uh, uh, transportation through airways, through uh, railways, maritime transportation. Iran is geographically positioned at a part of the world which can be uh, profitable for all to go through Iran. Unfortunately, because of undue sanctions, uh, the world economy has uh, uh, not benefited from this economic uh, um, opportunity and capacity. Um, on other fields, on oil and gas, uh, Iran's resources being the largest uh, uh, reserve of natural gas worldwide and the third largest inventory of oil uh, can be the one of the best sources for energy security, especially for Europe, and also for environmental purposes. Gas is the clean resource of energy. So uh, uh, the opportunities for development of gas resources uh, through LNG, for example, can reach uh, even far markets for that purpose. Uh, along the same lines, uh, the other opportunities in mining field, in ICT, um, in hospitality industry, uh, provide ample uh, opportunities for foreign investors uh, we have done a great deal of work in the last uh, uh, two years for improvement of uh, business environment. And the international indices show that more than 20 points improvement uh, show that uh, the government is uh, very serious in uh, cutting the red tape, uh, facilitating trade. Uh, Iran has already um, uh, being a, uh, an observer uh, in WTO. Uh, Iran is willing to be a full partner in WTO. Uh, that would provide even better environment for uh, international uh, collaboration and cooperation. Uh, I think the message from Iranian economy is uh, that uh, uh, Iran has the capacity to be the most promising emerging economy in coming decade uh, and would like to share this opportunity with foreign investment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we open now the floor for questions. If you could s uh, state your name and uh, organization for the, for the sake of the online audience, Ali, please.
Mayor spoke about democracy and the elections uh, that are soon to come. Uh, the Revolutionary Guard is its own institution in, in Iraq, uh, economically, in terms of the ju judiciary, in terms of security. And there is some sense since the signing of the deal that the leadership of the Revolutionary Guard is not only not on side about this deal, but may be outside of your orbit and the President's orbit. Can you characterize for us the role of the Revolutionary Guard and what their position is on the issue? Well, I think uh, uh, your information is greatly exaggerated. Uh, people like uh, exaggerated news, and that uh, makes headlines. But, but the Revolutionary Guards are a part of the Iranian government. We're all very proud of them because we, they played a very active role in defending Iran uh, with, with the Iranian army. Uh, they're an important institution within the Iranian uh, governance. Uh, they're not a separate institution. They're not a government of their own. They have supported the nuclear deal. Of course, Iran is not a monolith. Iran has many views, and that's good. It's good that we can entertain v a variety of uh, opinion from those who believed uh, strongly uh, in the virtue of the negotiations to those who protested in the most vehement terms. Uh, I think you can see th the same uh, basically in the United States, with the difference that uh, in, in Iran, those who were opposed to the deal were not opposed because they wanted nuclear weapons, but because they did not trust the United States due to past U.S. approach towards Iran, and we hope that the United States would take measures now in order to remedy that mistrust that is deep-rooted within uh, the general Iranian population from the most secular to the most religious elements in Iran. So I do not see the Revolutionary Guards as a problem. You saw the cooperation between uh, the Iranian government, uh, the foreign ministry, and the Revolutionary Guards in the release of U.S. sailors, which uh, was smooth, uh, happened in, 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 in a very short uh, interval, because the Revolutionary Guards and, and the foreign ministry determined that the sailors had, in fact, astrayed uh, into Iranian territory. It was not intentional. There was no need to keep them. And that is why we set them free. So that if that is an example, you will see what is to come in the future. I do not believe uh, a duality or a dichotomy needs to be uh, injected into, into the Iranian system. In fact, we have a multitude of views uh, within the Revolutionary Guards, outside the Revolutionary Guards, and that is a sign of a good, healthy, vibrant democracy. Thank you. So, Paul, and then please the lady in the back afterwards. regional stakeholder in the talks uh, on Syria. Um, could you tell us, uh, will you recognize as uh, a representative uh, the opposition uh, uh, spokesmen who've been chosen at the meeting in Saudi Arabia uh, to sit at the table? And uh, how do you envisage, in the medium term, the future of Iraq with or without uh, President Assad? Final question, if I may. Uh, uh, I know that relations with Saudi Arabia are uh, uh, broken at the moment. Uh, are you doing anything here in Davos to try and fix them? Uh, a little bird told me you might be meeting Prince Turkey. Is that correct? Uh, That's and the fourth question, Paul, right. already. Oh, Thank you. I, Can we get the microphone to the lady four. in the back there? Well, as far as Syria is concerned, uh, unfortunately, Iran was excluded uh, because of some pressure from the country you named uh, in the past. Uh, from uh, the nuclear, from the Syrian discussions. Since Iran was included, I'm not boasting, but uh, roads opened up to, to an agreement. For the first time in, uh, in uh, four years, you had the first sec meaningful Security Council resolution coming out of the Syria talks. I'm not saying it's only due to Iranian presence, but it certainly played a role. We have presented ideas about peace in Syria. We believe that peace in Syria comes through uh, giving the decision to the Syrian people, not determining for the Syrian people what should be the decision. We believe that th we should not set preconditions. Now I think uh, the majority of the international community has come along on our side. Uh, some people were setting because of the, ho the they were uh, basically entrenched in a position uh, that was not viable, that somebody has to go before you have a political process in Syria. And that dragged the conflict for almost five years now. 
because some of our friends in the region believe that Syria war would be over within three weeks. You remember the story about end of Syria war by the end of Ramadan. We have had four Ramadans since then, and the Syria war still drags on because there is an illusion in our region that there is a military solution to Syria. That's only an illusion, and Iran knew that that was an illusion, and we insisted on a political uh, resolution of this issue. That is why we put on the table a plan for a re political resolution, a four-point plan, which according to Secretary Kerry in his speech before the Security Council formed the basis for the Security Council resolution that is now out. That plan requires everybody to engage in a ceasefire, localized as it may be, or general ceasefire, uh, a national unity government, dialogue inside Syria in order to revise the Constitution and elections based on that Constitution. That is the gist of what a political process must be. You cannot determine the outcome of this political process before it starts. That was the attempt. You do not enter a negotiating room with uh, the outcome already decided. You're supposed to decide the outcome in the negotiating room. As far as for the opposition is concerned, the United Nations, <coughs> Mr. De Mistura, is entitled and was mandated by the Security Council to form the opposition and to call who the opposition is, to form the opposition delegation. Uh, the insistence by Saudi Arabia in the meeting in New York that the group that was formed in Riyadh form the opposition was rejected, basically. It is the job of Mr. De Mistura to form that opposition. And Mr. De Mistura will form the opposition based on the principle of first including all opposition groups and then excluding those who belong to internationally recognized terrorist organizations, and we have three of them now. ISIS, and nusra and Al-Qaeda. So anybody who is a card-carrying of any of these three terrorist organizations, card-carrying member, should be excluded. Unfortunately, in Riyadh, there were 10 card-carrying members of uh, Al-Qaeda present. So they cannot be included, but that is not for us to decide. We are not making a determination. We are not going to say who should participate and who should not participate. It is for Mr. De Mistura to, to decide who will participate, and I'm sure he will apply this agenda, this, this criteria on who should participate. Did I answer all questions, or did I? I think you got No, there those. won't be a secret meeting uh, here. Uh, Iran uh, did not break diplomatic relations. Iran responded with a lot of self-restraint to uh, extensive provocation by Saudi Arabia, including its fight to destroy, uh, to destroy the nuclear deal. Before it, well, it, it, well, it took shape, it spent millions of dollars in the United States to kill it in Congress. It has done everything it could to undermine it since its inception. Now, thankfully, and because of the resilience of the Iranian people, we put it, we implemented it long before people thought it was possible. So I believe our Saudi neighbors should come to their senses and understand that they have a much better future in collaboration and coordination and accommodation with Iran, and we're ready for that. Thank you. Yes. Kathy Newman from Channel 4 News. What do you say to EU companies on sanctions? Because obviously the nuclear sanctions have been lifted, but some US sanctions remain. What do you say to those EU companies that are nervous about breaching those sanctions? And uh, given that there's an underrepresentation of female delegates and the guys all got several questions, just a couple more. Um, uh, now that oil is at 28 US dollars a barrel, how does that affect your plan to get Iranian oil back onto the market? And just to press you on that final question on relations with Saudi Arabia, I, I'm not sure you quite answered uh, the, my colleague's question on, on just how you're gonna rebuild relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Okay. Thank you. If you could pass the microphone just to the lady in front well, of you. I'll just answer the last question. The other two uh, are directed more at Dr. Nav and Dion, who knows much better than I do. Uh, as I told you, we did not break diplomatic relations with Saudi Arabia. They did. Actually, there was no reason to break diplomatic relations because the, the embassy incident was condemned at the highest level. Today, even the leader condemned it. The president condemned it, we condemned it, every segment of the society condemned it. We took measures to, uh, to prevent it. Unfortunately, we failed. We considered it as, as an affront, affront to our security that this uh, incident happened. We immediately informed the Saudis that their security and safety of their diplomats was totally uh, assured 
and we provided them with extra police protection, they decided to break diplomatic relations. Then, decide, then they decided to up the ante by asking others to, uh, to break diplomatic relations. Then de they decided to up the ante by breaking all commercial ties with Iraq, breaking all uh, travel even between Iran and Saudi Arabia. We have not done any of that. Well, it takes two to tango, as you say. And we, we are already beyond halfway. We have not done uh, any act of provocation. We have uh, exercised self-restraint with regard to their pro provocative acts. We have always been open to dialogue with all our neighbors. We actually propose dialogue with our neighbors. We are ready. We believe that Saudi Arabia needs to make a choice. Saudi Arabia has tried to, to keep the old status quo in our region because they thought change was not in their interest. We believe they were mistaken. We believe they unnecessarily panicked and they created a lot of mess in our region. We are prepared to undo that unfortunate situation that they have created by panicking because we believe that was uncalled for to begin with. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, yeah. No, he has well, to answer. She, she just mentioned about the oil, and that's exactly what I wanted to okay. ask you. I'm from uh, Nikkei Group, uh, Nikkei Plus 10, Malgo, Kutani. And I would like to ask you about the oil. Uh, oil price is really rapidly declining. And uh, you actually uh, will be exporting oil as well. And including overall within the uh, OPEC, you have decided that there will not be uh, the reduction of the production of the oil uh, in the near future. Now, um, joining um, as one of the, the export countries of the oil, are you going to be addressing that there should be the reduction in the near future to raise the prices of the oil? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, exactly for the purpose of clarification of what is to be done after lift of sanctions, uh, one of the outcomes of JCPOA ne negotiations in the document itself, there was one annex uh, uh, related to uh, the sanctions, lifting of sanctions. And right after that, may, as uh, uh, EU 5 plus 1 have committed themselves, they worked hard on providing two guidelines, one by EU and one by United States, along with a, a FAQ document, just to serve the purpose of clarifying to the business community of what they can do after lift of sanctions. Uh, European companies uh, can refer to that guideline, which uh, shows very vividly that all areas of business now is open. Anything which was related to uh, nuclear-related sanctions are now open. And uh, with regards to uh, American rules, uh, as it has been uh, clarified in that uh, uh, public uh, announcement, uh, not only European companies, even U.S. subsidiary companies, which have interests for U.S. persons, now they are uh, allowed to do uh, business with Iran, uh, especially the uh, European financial institutions. Now they can have all kind of transaction with Iranian banks, which are now out of sanctions. Uh, with the exception uh, and uh, regarding the practice of not transiting uh, their uh, financial transaction through American land. Number two, not having transaction with uh, uh, the enlisted persons and uh, not taking the a participation of their branches in the United States. Otherwise, an, a European financial institution
can have all the dealings with Iranian banks from the day of implementation. And they have already started. They have started um, having uh, LCs being opened. And with regards to other companies, multinationals, as long as they are practicing uh, uh, the investment, trade, financing of trade and investment, all kinds of that is allowed. All of those sanctions are lifted. And uh, the document goes uh, uh, as far as clarifying the uh, concept of snapback, which was part of the JCPOA document that uh, in the case that uh, there is some um, break in the uh, implementation from either side, they have expressed that both sides will try uh, not to go back to the sanctions. So they will have all of their efforts uh, to serve that purpose. But even in the case of any sanction coming back, all investment contracts will not be affected. So that would give uh, enough of peace of mind to uh, companies, international companies, to engage in uh, different kinds of um, business with Iran. On the oil issue, uh, one of the outcomes of uh, these uh, long sanction years was that Iranian economy uh, instead of relying too much on oil revenue, now it's re relying on uh, other lines of production, goods, services. For example, uh, the budget which was uh, uh, given by the government to our parliament just last week by the president, the reliance on oil revenue is a record low. It is only 25%. And you just compare that with other oil producing and oil exporting countries, and you can see that uh, how vulnerable they are and uh, the uh, level of vulnerability in Iranian economy and budget has become very low. Uh, you said that uh, the oil price is diminishing. Not everybody is uh, in agreement with you. Uh, there are some analysts who uh, are looking at the prospect of increase in world growth rate in 2016. And the demand will go up. Uh, f on the point of Iranian position on supply of oil, uh, Iran uh, would certainly go back to its uh, share in oil market. Now that the sanctions are lifted, uh, we have to go to the balance that we had before, but uh, all oil producing and exporting countries uh, can have uh, the chance to come together and uh, make a decision on a fair base. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mindful of the time, maybe yes. we have time for one short question, please. Uh, I, uh, Foreign Minister Zarif, hi, Jimmy Keaton from Associated Press. Um, you mentioned the incident with the sailors. Uh, I, um, what, if any, apology did you receive from U.S. officials with regard to that? And if you could please comment on the please what, some, what some are calling a humiliating video of the sailors. Well, we were told that the sailors were in Iranian waters by mistake, that they did not intend to violate Iranian uh, territorial waters, uh, and that uh, they have taken measures in order to avoid this in the future. Uh, the sailors themselves did offer uh, apology. Uh, I do not particularly like that picture, but uh, it seems to me that uh, pictures were taken and were leaked to the press today, al almost nothing can be controlled. You have to understand that these were armed men who had transgressed into our territory, and at the time of their capture, at the time of their capture, before our uh, Coast Guards, Revolutionary Guards, uh, Navy,
determined that they had lost their way and were there uh, unintentionally, they had to follow normal procedure. And normal procedure is to board the ship, disarm its members, and arrest them, and bring them to shore, and investigate what happened. So no humiliation was intended. The picture that was taken was in order to show that there was no mistreatment. Other pictures were taken in order to show that the people who were arrested were being treated well. Now, some of the pictures may have been best left uh, in, the, in the archives uh, for future reference if anybody raised a question of mistreatment rather than released to the press. Bec but these days, we cannot control you guys. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're out of time. I know there's a lot of questions. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. And uh, a special thank you to our panelists. Thank you very thank much. You.